In 1850, in Paradise, California, an endless queue of vagabonds keep on waiting for their turn in a brothel. They call for Angel, the most beautiful and requested girl in the establishment. From the inside, Angel sees the excitement of the eager crowd claiming her services. The Duchess shows up, stating that just one more lucky man would be charmed by Angel, and then she would be done because she is worn out. Every single man raises their ticket to be the chosen one so the landlady offers more girls, stating they are from a wide diversity, Chinese, African, and even Spanish. However, the crowd is still fervently clamoring to spend time with Angel. The owner says that if they want that then they will have to wait for the next day. The winner is beastly happy but is quite different for Angel. She looks out of the window and her cold, dejected expression shows how sad and empty she feels for leading such a life. In a memory, a little blonde girl called Sarah is picking flowers in a colorful garden for May, her mother. Later, May looks a bit tense but thanks Sarah for the flowers, and arranges her beautiful golden hair. They are waiting for someone to come over, the mother also mentions that the guest's favorite color is blue, and reminds her daughter to stand up straight and act like a lady. In a carriage drawn by black horses, an elegant blonde man with wide light blue eyes arrives. In the living room, May calls for Sarah who is doing her best, showing a bright radiant smile. But although her mother claims how beautiful she looks, Alex, the fancy man shows apathy. Sitting on an armchair, cross-legged and indifferent, he asks May if she chose the blue color of the girl's dress on purpose, because it brings out the color in her eyes. Confused, Sarah looks at her mother who looks apologetic. The fancy man calls for a maid but May remarks that she sent her to town. At that instant, he assures her that they are in trouble and with a menacing look of disapproval begins to slowly get up. There we realize that he is the girl's father as Sarah calls him that way but he is not happy about it. When the little girl thanks him for the gifts, her mother interrupts her but her father asks her to continue. By this time the man cannot contain his anger, he asks Sarah to go out to play, because he wants to talk to her mother alone. Alex yells at May that those presents were sent for her and not for an illegitimate daughter. He then hits May while Sarah on the other side of the window hears everything and bursts into tears. The carriage leaves and in the garden, May meets her daughter who is sitting under a tree. Sarah says she does not want her father to come back, while May tries to hide the marks on her cheek but Sarah sees them. The little girl mentions that if she gets sick and goes to eternal sleep, her father could go back to her mother. Horrified May tells her not to say that again, and that none of what happened is her fault. The mother caresses her daughter warmly on the cheek, and looking into her eyes expresses the immense love she feels for her. Back in the brothel, Angel stands in front of a mirror and it is then that we assume that she is actually Sarah. She is so focused on the memory that she doesn't hear one of her colleagues telling her that it's break time. Sharing some shots, Angel is chatting with two harlots, Frenchie and Mai Ling. One of them tells them that she suffered a lot when living with her aunt, perhaps the meanest person she ever knew. Frenchie shows scars on her back caused by the mistreatment of the aunt. Mai Ling also tells her story, she says that her father got rid of her for three gold ounces, claiming that she would be in a palace. Then, they ask Angel about her plans but she is completely hopeless about the future. Although the two girls encourage her to expect more from life, Angel affirms that she never looks back nor forward. On a farm, we see a farmer feeding sheep, cleaning the barn, and plowing the land. He is Michael and he is a man of the Lord. In a chapel he prays and thanks God for protecting his land. When he finishes his prayer, he leaves but stops and walks back to the altar. With some embarrassment, he asks the Lord for someone to share everything he has, because he feels lonely. Back in the village, while Angel walks, the men continue to mistreat her. Michael looks at her with admiration and asks who she is. His brother Paul explains that every Monday and Friday she goes for a walk accompanied by her bodyguard, since no one can come within a meter of her without paying. Michael, dazzled, expresses his desire to meet her, to which his brother, with a mocking tone, replies that he must be patient since she is a very sought-after girl, and that the Duchess makes a lottery to decide, who will spend quality time with Angel. Michael can't believe she's a pleasure giver, but doesn't care at all, he continues to enjoy his walk while smiling sappily. In his buggy, Michael looks into the building window and finds Angel watching him. Going back in time, Cleo the maid explains to Sarah that all men want is to use women. That's what her father did, May gave him everything she had, but instead of giving back he took everything away from her. In a rage, May ruins the flowering garden and flees with Sarah. To live, she must sell everything she owns, including her jewelry. Unfortunately, a fake emerald pendant is worthless, so the jeweler indecently proposes to sleep with May in exchange for five dollars. May has no choice but to accept. She sets out to sleep with men for money while her daughter waits for her outside. Sarah proposes to her mother to go away from there, but the worst is about to happen. Due to obvious deeds, May contracts a disease that destroys her and despite her daughter's prayers, she dies soon after. Sarah is devastated, the only thing she has left of her mother is a crucifix, which she throws into the water in despair, utterly disappointed in God. Back at the palace, Magowan, the guard bangs vehemently on Angel's door. When he gets inside, he accuses her of hiding something. He grabs her by the throat and Angel insults the guy by calling him an insulting name. 
The Duchess appears and stops him. Angel must be ready for work in two hours and must not have a scratch on her beautiful face. Then, a shy Michael hires Angel's services but to the girl's surprise, he is not interested in having romantic moments with her. He treats her very politely, calling her ma'am, and asking her real name. Angel says that it doesn't matter if he is married, they can do whatever he wants there, but Michael smiles and answers that he is not married, at least not for now. The boy intends to marry Angel and give her a good life. However, the girl is discouraged and not interested. He is the fifth person to propose marriage that same week. As Michael continues to refuse having romantic moments, Angel throws him out of the room by slamming the door in his face. But Michael doesn't give up and pays again, this time double, to spend more time chatting with Angel. The boy offers to get her out of there but Angel, lying on the bed laughs at him and says he's wasting his gold. Michael asks her if being there is really what she wants for the rest of her life. Angel tells him that it is none of his business, she's still not interested. The smiling boy leans on the girl and proposes again to marry her, but all this is interrupted by the guard who enters saying that time is up. The next day, Michael tells Paul that Angel turned him down again, but that he still has enough money to see her one more time. Paul advises him to change his tactics but also exclaims not to waste his money, no woman is worth that kind of gold. Nevertheless, Michael disagrees and is willing to try again. In the pleasure house, one of the girls asks about the man who had gone to see Angel. She pretends not to know and asks which one she means. The lady describes a tall handsome gentleman with dark hair and light blue eyes. Obviously, she is talking about Michael. Angel rises from her seat and with a condescending look, an indifferent tone of voice claims that she doesn't care about the guy, that the lady can have him, and that she'd be doing her a big favor. Later that night, Michael arrives and heads to Angel's, but is intercepted by the young woman who wanted him. She tries to seduce him by gently caressing his shoulders, and mentions that Angel said he will have a better time with her, but Michael turns her down. He is there to see his beloved. In the room, Angel greets him reluctantly. Michael asks her if she is happy to be in that horrible town, full of drunken men fighting in the mud, and waiting for the opportunity to pay for her services. Angel says he mustn't care about her so they argue. She listens to him speechless, as Michael assures her that maybe she's acting that way, because she is unable to feel something. Angel angrily replies that he can leave the room with his pretty boy smile, but he says that if she wants to see him smile, all she has to do is say his name. The girl doesn't remember it so the young boy grabs her cheeks and sighing, says his name is Michael, he lets his feelings take over and gently kisses her. Angel grabs the back of his neck but at that moment Michael realizes that she is not doing it out of love and asks her to stop, they can't do that yet. The boy says they should wait until she feels something for him. But Angel disheartened states she feels absolutely nothing and that he is just a dirty farmer. Sighing heartbroken, the young man agrees and leaves. However, this encounter moves Angel's heartstrings, as she looks out her window when Michael leaves town. Back in the past, Sarah is in Boston with the jeweler. They enter an elegant building where a lady welcomes and guides them upstairs. Sarah doesn't understand what she is doing there, scared she just looks down. The lady says her name is Sally and asks the girl for hers, but the jeweler interrupts saying she is a shy little girl. Sally realizes something is wrong so she begs the jeweler to get her out of there, but he doesn't care, Sarah's mother died and he says she will be better off in that fancy place. Sally warns him that it won't be like that but anyway, the jeweler doesn't listen to her. In an elegantly decorated office upstairs, Sarah is seated while the jeweler drinks a few shots of brandy. Then, the owner of the place, an imposing and menacing man named Duke arrives along with Colin, his buddy. Looking sidelong and disgusted at the jeweler, Duke asks him if he is enjoying his brandy to which he replies, that it is the best he has ever tasted. Duke mentions that he must pay him and asks for the girl's name, but the insensitive jeweler says he can call her whatever he wants. Duke orders his buddy to take care of the jeweler and without warning, he punches him straight in the face and puts him to eternal sleep. Duke points out that she is an intelligent girl and says she is his little angel from now on. A few years later, a familiar visitor arrives on the scene. Duke, accompanied by Angel, approaches the guest. The owner introduces them and we notice that this man is Alex, Sarah's father. He asks her if they've met before since Angel looks like someone he used to know, but Angel plays it cool and accompanies him to a room for romantic moments. When Alex finds out what happened he is completely devastated, shaking and in tears he points a to his temple and pulls the trigger, blowing his brains out. Angel, without clothes at the foot of the bed, feels the same way about the atrocity Duke forced her to do. Sally takes pity on Angel and helps her flee the place. The girl boards a boat and leaves town. Unfortunately, Duke learns that Sally helped Angel escape so he orders Colin to put her to eternal sleep. On the boat, Angel meets two women. They say they could make good money by doing pleasure business themselves. It's better to do that than to have dirty men do it for free. Angel is not entirely convinced but with her head down she agrees, as she has no other choice. However, when they land, the other two women strike Angel to steal her winnings, leaving her without her money and with a broken face. Back in the present, Angel lies in her bed when Frenchie comes and gives her a drink but she rejects it. Although her friend thinks Angel is ill, the blonde girl claims she was just thinking about her mother. Frenchie asks how she was, Angel responds she was beautiful and shattered. 
Then, Angel says that she has had a headache since Michael began to stalk her. Both laugh briefly and Angel is asked if she regrets turning him down, but she doesn't because no man would be her owner. Frenchie agrees and explains that the Duchess wouldn't let her go anyways, but Angel mentions a deal she has with the Duchess. The owner of the brothel would keep Angel's money until she is ready to leave. But Frenchie opens Angel's eyes by explaining that the women who left the place were either too sick to work or passed away. That conversation sticks in her head and worries Angel, so she decides to talk with the Duchess in her room. There the Duchess has an extravagant breakfast and although Angel's presence bothers her, she and invites the girl to eat something. But Angel is only there to demand her gold. The Duchess laughs and asks her why she wants it. The girl says it belongs to her. Her boss deflects the talk by offering coffee. But Angel insists she wants her gold to go away and live in a place of her own. With false surprise, the Duchess suggests she's getting ambitious and asks if she's looking to compete against her. Angel laughs, remarking that she would go away so as not to interfere with her business, and that she just wants to be left alone. Maybe she can meet someone and get married. The Duchess scoffs at her intentions, she will end up washing and cooking for a man and having romantic moments whenever he wants it for free. Angel doesn't listen to her and returns to claim her gold, but the Duchess is not willing to lose her best product. According to her, everything she gives Angel, food, silk clothes, and shelter costs money. But Angel is no idiot and with an ironic smile on her beautiful face claims that the feasts she has are nothing compared to the meager food she offers the rest. Angel's blood begins to boil and she hatefully adds that everything the Duchess has is because of her work. Fed up, Angel throws a cup that shatters into pieces, and tells her that even if she rejoices in all her extravagance, it doesn't make her a Duchess of anything. The boss remains unmoved until Angel provokes her by saying that no one wants to have romantic moments with her, and that she must pay the Magowan to be satisfied. The Duchess quickly rises from her chair and grabs Angel hard by the throat. She tells the girl not to forget that she was found abandoned in an alley, full of mud and blood. The Duchess affirms it was her, who turned Angel into a princess and she can take everything away from her. As Angel cries and says she must get out of there, the guard takes her to a room by force. Once there, Magowan throws her to the floor and says how much he is going to enjoy but surprisingly for him, Angel's response is to laugh derisively. Confused, the guard asks her what is so funny, Angel, unable to contain her laughter, tells him that he is funny and just a lapdog of the Duchess who also owns him. Magowan kneels, caresses her face, and threatens to eliminate her but Angel provokes him. During the mistreatment, Angel laughs nonstop. The guard gives her such a mistreatment that the girl's face is completely swollen and covered with bruises. The next day, Michael comes to the palace and sees Angel's condition. With no hesitation he pays for her debts to the Duchess and takes the poor girl to his home. Once there, Michael gives her some dresses to wear. The boy explains, these clothes belong to his late sister Tess who was Paul's wife. But while lying in bed, Angel gives him the ring back, because marriage has ended up and claims that she won't be there for so long. The guy explains that marriage is not slavery and gives her the ring again. Three weeks later Angel is way better and as she sees Michael leaving the place by horse, takes advantage and sets off on the return to paradise. Back at home, Michael realizes she has left and goes to look for her. He meets the girl one mile away and although she claims he's not her owner and slaps him in the face, the boy lets her do what she wants and only gives her some water, otherwise, she would never reach the town. At night, Angel appears at Michael's home. The farmer feeds the girl and cleans her feet with warm water. Although Angel offers to give the favors back through pleasure, the boy refuses. The next day Angel explains that being a wife is not for her, but she will go with the flow until she pays the favors back. Michael teaches her how to do different farm work just to spend time with her. They enjoy time together and little by little they become closer. One night, when Angel was sleeping alone, Duke appears. He slowly approaches her and gets on Angel, but it was just a nightmare. The farmer wakes her up and takes her to the fields to watch the sunrise. Michael tells her she could have a new life with him. Back in the house full of passion, they kiss, and they fiercely unite their souls. This is the first time Angel makes love to him with emotions attached. One day a drunken, filthy Paul shows up, Michael is happy and says he is now married, but his brother-in-law freezes when sees Angel wearing his dead wife's dress. In the kitchen, Paul disapproves of the marriage and tells Angel she is not worth it, his brother deserves a decent girl rather than a pleasure giver. In the barn, Paul warns Michael that Angel was the highest priced pleasure giver in the pleasure house, and insults her. The farmer is upset and punches him, but then he apologizes and advises Paul to go to church. The next day, Paul is going to town to sell supplies. So Angel joins him to go back too, but that's going to cost her. Paul forces her to have pleasure, as has no other choice Angel exceeds but she is devastated. When they arrive in the town, Angel finds the palace has been burnt. A man tells her what has happened, Mago and burnt the place and the people in the town put him to eternal sleep. This man offers her a job as a pleasure giver and Angel agrees. When Paul returns to the farm Michael knows what happened, so he sends his brother home. The young farmer, determined to get Angel back, enters the pleasure place, 
and after getting involved in some fist fights, he saves her. On the way home, Angel asks Michael if Paul has told him what happened, to which the guy replies that he realized due to the guilt pouring from his face. The girl is confusingly angry and doesn't understand why he came to rescue her, but Michael loves her and he needs no more reason than that. In tears, Angel desperately cleans her body in the water, because she feels dirty but the farmer calms her down, says everything is okay and with a smile on his face, he forgives the girl. Angel feels she has lots of demons and doesn't deserve Michael's love. The farmer tells her he also has demons, his father was a slave owner and when Michael told him that he would set them free, his dad gave him a mistreatment. Michael adds that his father also sent a girl to him to do whatever he wanted but he did nothing to her. The following day he left his house and dropped everything behind. Angel realizes she is not the only one with an obscure past. On a road near the farm, Michael and Angel help a family of four with the mother pregnant, because one of the carriage wheels broke. They give the family food and shelter at their house, and the family is thankful. Once the baby is born, the father makes two announcements. One is that his youngest son was called Michael after the farmer, which flatters and pleases Michael. The second announcement is they are staying in those lands. With Michael's help he bought the land. On the other hand, Paul, who had come to apologize to his brother, will build a house for them. While planting seeds, Angel remarks how much Michael and Miriam, a daughter of the family, have in common. Michael laughs, fooling around Angel. He asks if she is jealous. Both chuckle but Angel claims that Miriam could give him children, something that she can't. The girl explains that she was once pregnant but a doctor made sure she is unable to have babies. Michael says that he loves her and that nothing is impossible. After that, Angel prepares food to have a romantic evening. They eat and then go to the place Michael had taken her to see the sunrise. There, they make love passionately but this is a kind of goodbye because the next day, Angel leaves an envelope for Miriam and leaves one more time. Miriam brings the envelope to Michael, and it is the ring and there is a letter saying that Miriam deserves him more than her. Michael doesn't go after Angel because staying with him has to be Angel's choice. In San Francisco, Angel gets a job as a cook and waitress in a pub. The owner also offers her a place to stay. The place is engulfed in flames that same night but they can put out the fire. The next morning, Duke appears in front of Angel, who is paralyzed. He and Colin threaten her and take her away. At the new establishment, Duke continues to mistreat girls which infuriates Angel. But the cynical Duke doesn't listen to her and tells Angel to get ready, because she will go on stage for a show that same night. When she is about to step onto the stage, Angel is desperate. The only thing she can think of is praying. If there's a god, she begs for his help. At that moment, the image of her mother appears on stage and encourages her to tell the people the whole truth about Duke. When she finally shows up on the scene, simply says that this man mistreats women, forcing them to do everything to survive. She also adds Duke bought her to do pleasure business. This speech makes Duke furious so he takes Angel off the stage. When he is about to draw his sword, a guy appears and helps Angel and other girls to escape. When the customers see this, they put Duke to eternal sleep. Three years later, a remorseful Paul sees Angel getting into a school. So he goes there and tells Angel that through all these years Michael has been waiting for her. Angel can't believe it, she thought that he would be married to Miriam but that's not how that went. The girl has never felt worth it and that's why she left. Paul realizes that he was wrong, tears drop out of his eyes, and begs for her forgiveness. Angel says that she has forgiven him a long time ago. Then, Paul convinces her to get back with Michael, who still loves her and is suffering. Back on the farm, Angel approaches an astonished Michael who can't believe his eyes. The girl claims her real name is Sarah but she never said it, because it was the only thing no one could take away from her. Crying in a combination of joy and regret she expresses her love and apologizes for having caused so much pain to him. Michael can't be happier and without hesitation takes the girl's chin while kissing her softly. He gives her the ring again and Sarah says she would never take it off. Some years pass by, Michael and Sarah are fishing but they have a little boy now. But it doesn't end there, Sarah is waiting for another baby so their dream has come to reality. And the family is going to be larger. In the end, Michael was right, nothing is impossible.